Thank you. All right, so let me just begin uh, and put in perspective. I'm going to start um, with, um, now it's on on, yes. It's on on, and does this start? Yes. I'm going to start with this painting of Turner. And in this painting, you see a sailing warship, the Temerari, being towed to its final berth where it's going to be chopped up for scrap. It's being towed by a steam-powered vessel in a setting sun of a different era. And so in several, gener several industrial revolutions, the world really changed, as mentioned by Professor Hench. <clears throat> if you flash between 1839 and this is, um, I see a battery flashing. Yes. Um, the world energy consumption in 2012 was very large uh, in terms of units. It's 550 quadrillion BTUs. But let's convert it to horsepower. So when we made this transition from human and animal power to mechanical power, it's as if we have 25 billion horses working for us around the clock all year round. Um, and the modern day equivalent of this is um, that we have pollutants that are associated with this energy supply, uh, perhaps roughly equivalent to the pollutants of horses. And so in this outline of the talk, I'm going to spend only two slides talking about why this climate change could be different and then go quickly to the topic with really how science and technology can give us many options. Why is this different? This is a record of the climate uh, as measured by oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, the bottom slide from the present time in the far right to 800,000 years. And you also have a record of Antarctica uh, ice core measurements of methane and carbon dioxide. And if you see where the levels are today, we're off the scale not only of the last 800,000 years, we're actually off the scale going back three million years from what had happened. And so this is one of the issues. And if you look at those, what appear to be rapid transitions uh, from warming, from uh, ice ages to warming and then a gradual cooling down, they look very abrupt. But those transitions actually occurred over 10 to 15,000 years. And so how does that compare to what we're undergoing today? Well, this is uh, a measure of our carbon dioxide emissions, but it also tracks the CO2 in the atmosphere. And the important point is that three quarters of our greenhouse gas emissions have occurred only in the last 65 years. So over a 10,000 year record, this is a very, very fast change. And um, to quote a, a famous Chinese philosopher, if you don't change direction, you will end up where you're heading. Um, all right. So for these reasons, uh, even though the climate models have lots of uncertainties, investing a very, very small fraction, I personally believe it doesn't have to be more than a half a percent of the GDP uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is just seen as a prudent insurance policy. One doesn't need to have 90% or 80% or 99% certainty in this. So let me also mention that this uh, issue of greenhouse gases uh, is in many things around the globe in all of our industries and indeed roughly 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from agriculture, forestry and land use in the form of N2O and lots of methane. The predominant methane emissions comes from agriculture and CO2 emissions. So it invades much of the developed and developing world economies. All right, so we heard before some talk about air pollution. So let me remind you a little bit about the history of smoking in the United States from 1900 to 2005. The black curve 
or the number of male adults who were smoking cigarettes. And at the peak of smoking in the United States around 1965, the average consumption of c cigarettes per person, per male adult person, was 225 packs a day, but that also included the non-smokers. So that's the average of the male adult population. And what you see in the blue curve is lung cancer deaths. And there was a huge public campaign to convince people not to, uh, young people to stop smoking. It was very successful. It has worked. And cigarette consumption has since plummeted. And 25 years later, lung cancer deaths have plummeted. The female deaths have risen later because women started smoking later. Um, and so we now know that, and we heard uh, lots of material before in a previous talk, that uh, smoking is very, very hazardous to your health, not only lung cancer, but coronary heart disease and stroke. All right, so this is a picture of Beijing and a bad air day. And uh, the particular matter, PM 2.5, is turning out to be especially <laughs> deadly. And many large epidemiological studies have started uh, the largest one that I know of uh, was published in Lancet Oncology, a British uh, medical journal. And it said that um, in 2013, looking at 12 million person years over a 12 year period, that every 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5, there's a 1.4 times higher chance of getting lung cancer. The average air quality in Beijing averaged around the year from uh, 2013 was um, 100 micrograms per cubic meter. And so that's, you take 1.4 and you raise it to the 10th power. So it appears as though the average air quality in major cities like Beijing are worse or comparable to smoking a package of cigarettes a day just by breathing the air. In Delhi it's worse. But there's no recent data because only recently have people been beginning to take reliable measurements of this. Now, um, what does this have to do with lots of things like uh, climate change? Well, the danger is not a 25 year delay. We don't know what the real delay is. It could be 100 years, it could be 200 years. But it's much longer because the bombs of the oceans are very cold and it takes a long time to heat up. And so secondary smoke is completely the issue uh, going on with climate change. The damage is mostly not on the smoker. The damage will be on the smoker's grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and their grandchildren. Now, let's go back to air pollution. And um, it turns out that uh, Yi Shui, who you've been hearing uh, soon on batteries, his group discovered that uh, nanofibers, polymer fibers, can miraculously take these small pollutants and filter them out very effectively. In fact, the filters appear to be so good that you can actually see through and see 55% of the light going through the filter in that middle picture that says T55, and you're actually trapping roughly 95% of the particles. Now, we have begun to examine what is going on. First, uh, Yi and I are, want to commercialize this filter material very quickly so it could be used in home filters, building filters, and coal plants. The mechanism appears to be the following. If you take a charged rod and put it near little pieces of paper, the piece of paper gets polarized and are attracted to the rod. And so what happens is the slight charge distribution on this little neutral particle in this field gradient goes to where the electric field is strongest. Um, we think this is the mechanism, and when Yi was telling me about this, I immediately said, I think I know what it is. The particles are mostly neutral. And he said, how do you know that? And I said, well, it's a guess. but." Uh, taking a laser beam and focusing it to a small spot where the electric field is highest was the fundamental idea of laser trapping. So it's, uh, it's a reprocessing an old idea that uh, 
help me get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in any case, uh, let's continue. What about science and technology? Well, the micro nanofibers are one example, but let me give you a few other examples. Uh, first, let me talk about energy efficiency, and it should be everywhere in transportation, processes, agriculture, cities, buildings. Let me pause and say that the 30% greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture have a huge opportunity to maintain productivity in agriculture and drastically reduce greenhouse gases and should be paid more attention. But in energy efficiency in buildings, 40% of all the energy in the world goes to buildings in heating, cooling, and lighting. Uh, it's a very energy intensive industry if you look at the materials that are used to build modern buildings. And the building structures and foundations really should be built to go for more than 100 years. Now, in a city like Rome, I think you've decided they should be built for a few thousand years, which is very good. Uh, however, in certain developed and developing countries, the, uh, the wanting to tear down buildings after 25 or 50 years is actually the rule. And, and it actually says that it increases the GDP. If you build a building, tear it down 25 years and build another building, but it's not real GDP. And so this very wasteful use of resources has to be looked at. Let me talk about wind and solar energy. Huge developments. The turbines uh, are going up. They're becoming much higher, catch much more wind. They're becoming much more reliable. And uh, so the costs of wind are going down. In Europe, Northern Europe, especially in the uh, Atlantic areas of Northern Europe, have tremendous wind resources. But wind offshore is still very expensive. And so one of the major things that one has to do is improve the reliability of these very large wind turbines. Uh, so there's a lot of research going on to do that, uh, having to do with better composite materials, direct drive using rare earth magnets, all these other things. But right now, offshore wind is very expensive. Solar, tremendous solar. Uh, this is a map of the United States and the solar resources with the same color code. You see um, Germany, Alaska, and Spain. Ironically, Germany did more to advance solar deployment than any other country in the world, I would say, and yet its uh, solar resources are comparable to Alaska. Um, this is a, uh, another map uh, uniformly coding it, and you see that in many areas of the world, solar power is, uh, has a great, great uh, potential. What about the cost? The cost of a module has come down dramatically since the late 1970s. And indeed, <coughs> this is a, what are called a learning curve. So as you go every factor of 10 more in production, the cost of the module goes down by a certain fraction. The bump a departure from the learning curve was a very large feed-in tariff from Germany, <coughs> followed by heavy investments, and the market crashed. The prices have come back, and now companies are beginning to make money again, and that green dot is where one expects solar uh, modules to be sold at a profit, and we're about there now. And so <coughs> the overall cost of solar power has declined 40 times since the late 1970s. This is the modules. But it's, the news is even better than that because in what are called reverse auction arrangements where a country like Dubai or Saudi Arabia or Peru or Mexico says to a developer, typically from Europe or the United States, come and you can use some land. You'll have to pay for the land use. You won't get a subsidy but we will stand by a contract you sign with a utility company to make sure that if you invest over a 20-year period, your bills will be paid. And so then people bid to see uh, who gets the lowest contract, and then they award it to uh, a contractor who think they think who can uh, be good on the contract. And so what has happened 
from 2013 to 2016 that the price has gone down by more than a factor two, just in a few years. Those prices are now becoming competitive with any form of new energy, which is very exciting. And then the far right hand side, you see a wind contract just signed in Morocco, three cents a kilowatt hour. In the United States, natural gas is very, very inexpensive. And if you say you build a new natural gas plant, of course, you don't know what the price of natural gas will be in the next 50 years, the lifetime of the plant. But if you assume it's $4 a million BTU, which is historically well below any historical price, it's about five cents a kilowatt hour. So these prices are becoming comparable and these are without subsidy prices. The New Mexico, Texas, uh, I multiply by 144 because we have a, a subsidy in the United States. So I raise the price artificially to try to uh, allow those data to be shown. The very exciting thing about solar is that there are roughly 1.2 billion people who have no access to electricity. And so here you have people putting on a hut in Ethiopia a, a solar panel. And so the wonderful thing about this type of energy is if that solar panel lasts for 5, 10, 20 years, people have access to electricity. And what, does, what do they do with this electricity? Well, the first thing people in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia do when they first get electricity is they buy a cell phone. And this cell phone allows them to bring to market their crops on time. It allows them to communicate with other people. And on the right-hand side graph, you see in uh, African countries, the invasion of solar uh, cell phones, rather, uh, from 2002 to 2014. And so you're getting to a position where the majority of people in these countries now have cell phones. What's the next thing you do? You get rid of kerosene lanterns. We talked about indoor air pollution from cook stoves and from kerosene lanterns, and it's estimated that these are killing maybe one and a half to two million people a year, and you replace it with an LED, which has its own battery. So the cell phone has a battery, the LED has a battery. When the sun shines, you pump water and you purify water and you store it above ground. So that's its own battery. And you can bring in very inexpensive refrigeration that could, with a block of ice that could perhaps last a day or two. So you don't need energy on demand all the time. <clears throat> when I was Secretary of Energy, we had to struggle with one thing because I said that technology three and four or five years ago had already existed and yet there was not a big uptake in it. What was going on? And it turned out that uh, business people were selling very, very bad LED lanterns to developing countries. So instead of lasting 5,000, 10,000 hours, they were lasting a few hundred hours. And that poisoned the water. And all of a sudden, people said, you asked me to give up my kerosene lantern, and this thing doesn't even work. It's sort of like the early experience with compact fluorescent light bulbs. And except it was worse uh, with LEDs in developing countries. And so we began to create organizations within the Clean Energy Ministerial, other organizations that voluntarily got countries to try to police unscrupulous business people, not to poison the water. So this is, again, something that's very important. You could have a successful technology, but if you have unscrupulous people, it actually ruins it. Ad adoption for several years, it sets it back. All right. So. Renewable energy costs, as have you seen, at the very best sites around the world, the best solar sites, good wind sites, is plunging. And already uh, not much of a stretch to say two and a half cents a kilowatt hour by 2030. Because of that, the U.S. Department of Energy just last year revised its goal because the goals that were set when I was secretary already were being met. We thought we were ambitious in 2009, 10, 11 but it's raced ahead. And so now the goal of U.S. Department of Energy for solar in the United States, not in Dubai, uh, is now set at three cents a kilowatt hour. Again, well below um, natural gas prices. But 
there's more to it than that. When you transition from a few percent to even 25 percent, the real costs are not that much. But going to 50 percent or 75 percent has huge challenges because the real cost of renewable energy includes the backup generation capacity when the sun isn't shining, when the wind isn't blowing. It means you have to have a much more enhanced transmission and distribution system that can manage two-way flows, can manage not energy on demand, but you use the energy, the, the renewable energy while it's there, but you have to shift to other forms of energy to keep industry going, to keep the lights on. And if, then it means energy storage. And so we don't have a lot of the pieces that will allow 50 or 75 percent uh, in place at the moment. Uh, so this transition from 10, 20, 25 percent to 75 percent is very challenging. What about nuclear power? Well, nuclear fission provides carbon-free energy on demand energy. So it has to be compared to fossil energy with carbon capture with the SOx, the NOx, the mercury, the particulate matter. So that's point number one. The other thing is the spent fuel problem does have a technical solution, but it has to be managed carefully politically. And nuclear nonproliferation is a real danger and requires international cooperation. Now, I threw out one of the slides about how do you make the next generation nuclear reactor safer. First, let me mention that the current generation of nuclear reactors are being made safer, even though they've been built 10 to 20 and 30 years ago. But the next generation really include much more thermal inertia. And um, I hope uh, in the following talks, uh, you, uh, the one of the speakers will talk not only about thorium, but about the uh, possibility of making the next generation nuclear reactors uh, have very, very low probability of a meltdown. Transmission distribution, also very essential, because you want to generate re energy where the resources are best. So if you look at this map of high voltage transmission in China, you can make a guess as to where those lines are going. They're going to hydroelectric sources, and they're going to wind resources, and they're going to solar resources. And so China is actually leading the world in the longest distance high voltage transmission lines. And they're just in the process of installing a 3,200 kilometer line, 1.1 megavolts, where about five or six percent of the energy will be lost in this line. So you don't really need superconducting. Now, if you compare this to the United States, this is what you have. <laughs> the last high voltage DC <coughs> line went in in 1989. And guess where they're go coming from? They're coming from hydroelectric sources. But because the electrical system in the United States is balkanized, um, there's, there's political issues. By political issues, I mean the following. If you look at the Northeast United States, in the upper right-hand corner, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, the most expensive electricity in the U.S. is there. But above our northern neighbor, Canada, wants to sell us cheap hydroelectric power at a lower cost. But there's great resistance of the power producers in the Northeast, because they have invested in power generating plants, and they don't want cheap energy coming in and destroying their asset. And so it's because of things like that that actually prevent <coughs> countries from gaining access to lowest cost solution. Not only, just forget about clean, just lowest cost. So these are all issues that one has to be aware of. Let me talk about another thing. Very complicated distribution and transmission system. And do we have the technology that can actually handle that? And so one of the great hopes is that machine learning that has made great advances in the last 10 years will be part of that. And so this is uh, uh, a machine building, beating uh, one of the leading Go players uh, that beat this person four to one. And uh, it's made remarkable strides in language translation, prediction failure, systems control. And we're gonna need machine learning to manage this very complex system autonomously. So in this cartoon of an energy system where you have many areas of energy generation, nuclear, coal, whatever, wind, 
uh, you can have machine learning. Right now, the substations are actually run by humans manually, but it's going to get too complicated. So you should have in the cloud somewhere this layered real-time monitoring and control. Uh, if you have distributed generation, if you're a hospital, a university, a big office building, uh, you can actually have a microgrid and you have to manage that. The machine can also tell you where outages are and how to manage that. And finally, we do have the technology that can send electricity to a specific region in, in an area rather than just putting up the voltage and it trickles down like water flows down. Uh, downhill, you can actually direct the energy uh, in much the same way you, as we are beginning to, we have learned to d direct bits of packets of information. So these are technologies, again, very, very complex and machine learning can handle that. Energy storage. So this is one of my favorite forms of energy storage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when the pump, <laughs> you pump water when the wind blows and you put it up a little higher and that's energy. And so somehow we've forgotten that. And so uh, we have to relearn energy storage. Uh, there's other things. The normal batteries for automobiles have plunged. They've dropped from roughly $1,500 in 2006 where it was essentially impractical to now 2014, the least expensive batteries are the Tesla Model S batteries, and they're about $300 per kilowatt hour. That green circle is the target price of manufacturing that Tesla expects by 2018. Um, so this is very exciting, and you're gonna be hearing about battery technology from Eastway at Stanford, and I'm just gonna skip through that. Um, but let me remind you of what real energy storage is about. If, in this graph, if you plot on the x-axis the amount of energy per unit weight, and on the y-axis the amount of energy per unit volume, you see leading the charge at the upper right-hand corner are diesel, gasoline, kerosene or jet fuel, and body fat. These are the highest energy storage uh, mechanisms, chemical storage. Down there, very, very close to zero, is the lithium ion battery. Now, you don't have to be quite as good as diesel. If you can get it just up to that green line, personal transportation goes over to um, battery powered vehicles because the engine is going to be 90, 95% efficient, not 30% efficient. And most people don't really need to fuel up to drive 400 miles in a few minutes. You do need to fuel up in five minutes to drive 100 miles um, because you rarely want to drive more than 100, 150 miles without going to the bathroom while you discharge your car charges. <laughs> uh, carbon capture is also very necessary uh, from power plants, but also steel, cement, plastic production. Um, but the cost is too high. Right now, the demonstrated ways we have it are so expensive that no one is seriously thinking of deploying that. And so we need to develop very much lower cost methods of capturing carbon. It's gonna be even more important because I unfortunately think we will not only go over 450 parts per million CO2, we are now carbon dioxide equivalent, which also includes N2O and methane, we're at 430 today. We're slightly above 400 in pure carbon dioxide. So we're already going over 450. So we will probably go over 550. And so these are two companies that I know of that are working very hard to cut the cost in half. Whether they succeed or not, I don't know. But unless it's about $30 a ton or less, it will not be deployed in the United States or China. And, um, and probably not Europe either. So it is possible to do that. And again, new materials and new approaches are very, very important. And new research in developing techniques are also very important. The lowest cost way to capture carbon dioxide is to grow plants. So that's photosynthesis. 
you make complex sugars, cellulose, hemicellulose, and from that you can turn those sugars into plastics, fuels, other chemicals, and then you sequester the excess carbon dioxide. If this is economical, all of a sudden you go to negative emissions because the plant is grabbing the carbon dioxide, you use the part you want, and you sequester the rest. The question is, is the rate of photosynthesis high enough? And the answer is yes. You can actually imagine practically grabbing and sequestering five gigatons or more of carbon dioxide using residual crop residues and other things like that. All right, so I'm gonna end by saying that the thing we really need the most before we can go completely off of fossil fuel and nuclear energy is we need to take water and split into hydrogen and oxygen. We need to reduce CO2 to make CO plus hydrogen, and then from that you begin to produce a liquid hydrocarbon. Now, if you have a liquid hydrocarbon that can be shipped on a tanker, how much does it cost to ship oil, for example, around the world? Halfway around the world is all the way around the world. And um, I'm a professor, I give you a quiz, but I can't take your answer, so I'm gonna tell you that the answer is, it's two cents a gallon. The price of fuel for shipping and uh, importing from one port to another port, including the pumping, is two cents a gallon. So tankers are a very, very good transcontinental transmission conduit line. So in order to go 100% renewable, because I don't really see how we're gonna get above 50, 60% renewable, unless we can capture the energy in compact liquid fuels. The liquid fuels will always be a factor of 30 to 40 times higher than any battery we can imagine. So you capture the CO2, you take hydrogen, you split the water, but in order to do both of these things, it's going energetically uphill and you need clean energy to do that. And so that clean energy is going to have to come from winds, from solar, from nuclear, from growing plants. So with that, um, I just want to close and say, again, um, Martin Rees said that this iconic picture uh, of, that's been taken up by environmentalists. The astronaut who took this picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon. The most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. <laughs> we've discovered that the moon is not a good place to live, that the Earth from that vantage point looks very good, and there's nowhere else to go. And the final thing, in terms of the generational responsibility is I remind you of an ancient Native American saying is we do not inherit the land from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Thank you.